The dust has finally settled on the Damian Lillard situation, and although I think Portland could have gotten a little bit more, I really love the direction that this team is headed in. The young core of Scoot Henderson, Anthony Simon, Shaden Sharp, and DeAndre Ayton has the potential to be a pretty fun team now, and a great one later. Today I'm going to be evaluating the Blazers' return for their arguable franchise GOAT and where they're headed, so let's get right into it. Before we get into this, if y'all could like the video and sub to the channel, I would really, really appreciate it. It does help me out a ton. We are closing in on 3K, so you know what I mean? If we could get there, I would really, really appreciate it, but let's get right into the video. Starting off with the Dame package, as I said, I think the return was solid, but I also think you could have gotten more. This obviously depends on what exactly you get in return for Drew Holiday, but I don't think they will get the two first round picks that they are seeking. I think the Drew Holiday return will be something along the lines of salary filler, one to two young potential rotation pieces, and a first rounder. Obviously, if Portland gets a ridiculous return for Drew, then this package becomes elite, but regardless, I'm fine with it. And that's largely due to the man who will actually be staying in Portland, DeAndre Ayton. While Ayton has his flaws, I like this pickup for Portland. You still get a somewhat young big with a good amount of playoff experience. Ayton is young enough to still grow with your young core, but old enough to offer some veteran elements. I know the main concern, which is a somewhat valid one, is his motor. While this isn't without substance, I think Ayton's situation in Phoenix has to be considered here. The Suns did not come to him with a max offer, and rather Ayton signed with Indiana, however the Suns had his restricted free agent rights and matched the offer. While Phoenix was obviously willing to pay up eventually, the already somewhat fractured relationship Ayton had with the Suns brass deteriorated further. Situations like these maximize present issues as far as motor goes. As far as I can tell by a video posted by the Blazers, Aiden looks happy and rejuvenated to finally be out of Phoenix. I already assumed Aiden would come back better feeling the disrespect, but I think this new situation in Portland will give him free reign to maximize his potential. You also have to consider the new CBA rules that would have likely resulted in an overpay that has a much lower ceiling, so I like this somewhat of a gamble for a rebuilding team. As for the rest of the package, I genuinely know nothing about Tumani Kamara, but that's another young piece. I think the 2029 first and the 2028 and 2030 swaps can be valuable, but there's potential for these to be teens at best. Obviously, anything can happen between now and then, but my thought has always been that Giannis will be a career buck, and this is even further solidified by the Dame trade. I'm well aware of the comments Giannis has made, however, I believe that this was simply a leverage play to make them get someone like Dame, just like he kind of did the same thing when they got Drew a few years back. Y'all let me know what you think about this, but as a Sixers fan, I couldn't help but think about the fact that we could have made a competitive package to that without Tyrese Maxey. The big substitute would obviously be Tobias Harris for Drew Holiday, but not only will Tobias Harris actually play for the Blazers this season, but they would be getting DeAnthony Melton, who could either be a solid young piece or likely flip for a first round pick, similar to Drew Holiday. Again, it's obviously different situations. Obviously, Drew is significantly better than Melton, but, you know, the main asset that you're going to be getting back in a Drew package would be a first round pick. You know, you're probably just going to get salary filler and maybe a guy, you know, like a Tumani Kamara, who's, you know, like a young guy on a cheap deal who wasn't, you know, a very highly touted prospect. So you'd still be getting, you know, a, a, again, you'd still be getting, you know, that main part of what you want for the Drew return. But a big, big part about this that I feel like separates us from Milwaukee is the picks. While it would have likely been the literal same exact amount and time of picks, a first and 29 and swaps in 28 and 30, ours would be of much higher value due to Embiid's injury and leaving concerns. While Giannis' game does heavily rely on athleticism and physicality, he is also a bit younger than Joel without a lot of the injury concerns. I think the Bucks could be a low lottery team by then, and obviously a lot can change and a lot of Milwaukee's core is older, but I think a 33-34 to 34 year old Giannis will be a lot better and more healthy than a 34-35 to 35 year old Joel Embiid, if he's even in Philly. I just want to get a gauge if I'm really off base or not, but I honestly just hate my franchise with every fiber of my being, and you know, again, they, they just never do the right thing, because why would you ever? But I really think this package would be better than the Milwaukee one. Again, let me know if I'm off base, but you could have gotten, again, you still would have gotten Aiton, obviously in the three team, nothing about that changes. You still get Aiton. Instead of Kamara, you would get Jaden Springer, who, I mean, I again, I mean, I, he'll probably end up, I, again, they're in the same tier of, like, just, like, random young guy who might be able to be something. And then you get Melton, who, again, you could easily flip because he's on an $8 million deal this year for probably a first or a ton of seconds. Again, I just really, and, and again, those picks later down the line, I think the Bucks could end up being bad. I think Giannis could end up leaving or steeply, steeply declining. 
but I feel like the, the Sixers are going to be in a much worse position by then, you know, given what I can predict right now. But anyways, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Portland's only other major move of the offseason, other than drafting Scoot Henderson, which I discussed in my video about him, was matching Matisse Thibel's three-year $33 million offer sheet. While an $11 million a year deal can't really be crippling, as someone who watched Thibel all his career outside of 22 games, I would feel wrong not advising Portland to tread carefully. I am aware that in those 22 games, Thibel shot 38.8% from deep on almost double the attempts he took in Philadelphia, but I'd just give it at least a few more months before drawing conclusions. We all know how impactful Thibel can be on the defensive end, and if even close to the three-point shooting we've seen so far in Portland continues, he will be a valuable piece. But another part of Thibel that has to be considered is how unorthodox of a defender he is. While he is a decent point of attack defender, his defensive impact is largely observed in how he plays lanes and often gambles. Thibel was someone I grew to want off my roster, and having watched a vast majority of his career, I felt obliged to tell the whole story. But if getting out of the hellhole that is the Philadelphia 76ers is what it takes for Thibel to blossom as I always hoped, Portland will not regret matching this offer. That is a large maybe, but Portland will be just fine regardless. I do want to discuss Scoot Henderson real quick even though I did have that other video largely centered around him, which y'all should go check out by the way. I am a complete believer in Scoot. I think Portland is very lucky that the Charlotte Hornets are a joke of an organization and that Scoot has perennial all-NBA potential. I love his game and having played in the G League, he's going to come in just as pro ready as almost anyone. The Blazers already have a few additional bright spots, but I just wanted to emphasize how much of a bright spot Scoot is to the point where I don't think Portland is going to have to go searching for a new superstar. One thing that makes me feel so confident about Scoot and thus the rest of this squad is Scoot's ability to create for others. Shooting is the main flaw in Scoot's game at the moment, but I don't think this will be any issue for Portland because of two guys. The first is arguably Portland's best player and someone who I strongly believe could average 25 points a night this season in Anthony Simons. While he obviously isn't Dame, Anthony Simons has the high volume 3 point efficiency to be an elite scorer in this league. In 119 games over the past two seasons, Simons has shot 38.9% from deep on 8.5 attempts a game. While his efficiency will likely drop with an inevitable increase in volume with the removal of Dame, I don't see why Simons can't shoot at least 37% from deep on 10 attempts a game. I think Simons has gone largely under the radar due to the lack of Blazers team success in the years he's been a major piece, but Portland very well may have their future Dame in terms of caliber of player in Scoot Henderson and a Dame light in Anthony Simons. I see no reason why Simons shouldn't average at least 23-5 this season, if not 25-5. He put up 21-4 last season playing alongside Dame who put up 32-7. The other player whose shooting potential is underrated but overall potential is great is Shaden Sharp. We all know about his athleticism and while 36% from 3 isn't bad at all but also isn't eye popping, what isn't seen until you take a deeper dive is that Sharp shot 45.5% on catch and shoot 3's in his rookie year. While he only averaged about 10 a game his rookie year, he also only played a bit over 20 minutes a night and was essentially straight out of high school since he didn't play in college. With the presence of someone who shows all the signs of a potential elite playmaker in Scoot Henderson, I think Sharp's potential becomes just that much more exciting. While I would start him over Matisse Thibel due to my personal disdain for him, Sharp will likely come off the bench and in a basketball sense it makes complete sense. Sharp's offensive talent will only be able to be utilized so much in a lineup with Scoot, Ant, Jeremy, and Ayton, and having him as a spark plug off the bench and thus going up against bench lineups will make him more effective. As for Jeremy Grant, it looks like he may be traded, but given that Portland has both Scoot and Sharp on rookie deals for the foreseeable future, and also realistically isn't going to have a great chance at a major free agent, I don't hate the signing completely. If he stays, I think he can be a good piece, and I honestly don't know where else Portland will put that money. If Portland were to make a major move, it would almost surely have to be a trade and likely be in 2-3 to three years. When slash if this were to happen and Grant were still in Portland, his contract would be much shorter and he would almost surely be in the package for whoever the Blazers decide to pounce on. This is where not only the picks Portland received in trades comes in, but also them having control of all of their own picks through 2030. If say we get two to three years down the road and Scoot is just an all-star level guy and not the superstar you thought he would be, the Blazers still have an out. Whenever a top three to five to 10 guy becomes available again, Portland has moved into a position to where they would likely be able to compete with the likes of Oklahoma City and San Antonio in terms of offering the best package. They will almost surely have another lottery selection next year. I think it won't be high lottery, but the West is really deep, so there definitely is a scenario where this team's place in the standings doesn't resemble how talented it actually is. 
I don't think it will be completely necessary. I believe the core of Scoot, Ant, Sharp, and Aiton with a fifth starter who is preferably a six foot seven plus three and D guy could be a top five seed in two to three seasons. Bottom line is pretty much no matter what they do from here on out, the Portland Trail Blazers are on a path to return to being a competitive playoff team in two to three seasons. While that is a long time to think about right now, it's not often you trade your franchise cornerstone and already have his potential replacement in the building. This was my main point in my first video about the Blazers. I really believe in Scoot and genuinely think the Blazers would somehow have to surpass the Sixers in going out of their way to mess things up for this team to not to be a contender in three years. Scoot was inevitably overshadowed by Victor Wembanyama, but I promise you he would have been a number one prospect in a number of other years. I know having this much confidence in someone who's never played is a bit crazy, but the point is you can basically be as confident in him as a number one pick. I think this Portland team will provide fun and excitement this season with flashes of the great potential within the young core. I'm really excited to watch this Portland team this season and beyond, and only time will tell if they play their cards right. If y'all enjoyed this one, please like it up and sub the channel, turn on that noti bell, comment down below, you know, your thoughts on Portland, what you think about the trade, what you think about where they're headed again, you know, I, as I said, I feel like they could have gotten a bit more in the trade, but I don't think it's bad at all, and again, they obviously value eight and higher than I think most of us do, so, I mean, hey, we're gonna see, but, you know, again, I think this is gonna be a really fun young team, I really do like Scoot Henderson, Shaden Sharp, you know, Anthony Simons, like, like there's, there's a lot of talent here. And I think, again, you know, these next two years are probably going to be rough. Uh, but in all honesty, I think they could be like a playing team next year. Like not 2023, 24, maybe though. But I, I think there's just too many good teams in all honesty for them to be top 10 in the West. Like they're probably the caliber of like a nine seed or an eight seed, like with the talent they have. But there's just so much parity in teams that they might end up lower. But in all honesty... If I was a Blazers fan, I'd rather be 13th than 10th because I'd I, if I'm not making the playoffs, I'd rather have the best shot at the highest pick, me personally. But hey, that's going to wrap this one up. Once again, if y'all enjoyed it, please like it up, sub the channel, turn on that noti bell. I'll catch y'all on the next one. Peace.